Welcome to The Good Word. My name is Vincent Goodwill, Senior NBA Reporter for Yahoo Sports. We are part of the Ball Don't Lie podcast. Get us wherever you get your podcast. It is Tuesday instead of Monday, but either way, we have a great guest. She is new to Yahoo Sports. She joined me, I think, for game three of the post game of the NBA Finals in Dallas. Ice Young, former college player, played in Greece. She's out here giving buckets and work <laughs> right now. Ice, how you doing? I'm good, fam. How are you? I am good. Look, like John said before uh, you jumped on, before we started recording, he said, stay away from stay away from ice on the floor because you're going to catch hips and elbows. <laughs> That's why I quit playing. That's why you quit playing. That's why I quit playing. I want to keep I want to keep ACLs and uh, ACLs intact and hurt feelings at bay. OK. Mm, mm, All right. Mm, I support not, it. Hey, hey, not doing that. So. <laughs> We're going to talk, of course, some W with ICE, and we're also going to talk some USA Basketball, some Summer League. So let's get right into it. Of course, let's get into the outlet where we connect on a head-to-head pass and get through several pieces of NBA news. Now, yesterday in Abu Dhabi, the U.S. took a huge lead on Australia and then took their foot off the gas, and Australia came back in 98-92. I saw some things from Anthony Edwards, who was starting, I saw, I noticed some things from the U.S. defensively. I wonder if you noticed sort of the same things, Ice. Uh, first off, is Ant doing the whole number one option thing? It, it, it looks like he's actually showing people I am the number one option. Does it Does it feel like he's saying, hey, old guys, move out the way I got this? Uh, yeah, I think so. One, like, it's so easy to get behind Ant-Man, right? Like, it's just his personality, the passion he plays at. Like, I think he reminds all of us who truly love sports, like, why we play, why we watch, why we're a fan of people who compete. Um, but, yeah, I also think, too, like, he's a young player who wants to have a, a long career in the game and has been given an early opportunity to start for Team USA uh, amidst one of their best rosters, I mean, that we've ever seen. Like, I absolutely think that, one, he kind of deserved to. I Two, I think he's a taking advantage of it. 17 points, 14 rebounds, like, went out there, did exactly what he needed to do. I thought he was very efficient and smart with the basketball as well. Um, and especially him being a young player amidst, you know, all those older guys, the LeBrons, the Stephs, et cetera. It's important that he still looks mature and that he's playing the same game they are. Uh, and to me, he did. Curious to get, you know, your thoughts. You know, it's funny. I long thought that Ant was going to be like the breakout guy of all mm. this. And just so you knew. The, oh, yeah. Look. So you knew. OK. I saw him in the set once from the second round on. I, I saw him in that series against Denver and then in the series against Dallas. And granted, they got waxed by Dallas, but they took out the defending champs in Denver. And you could just see you can see the hunger. You can see him sort of being active enough and in including guys, but also recognizing the moment. And he said it to me in Vegas. And he was like, you know, when I when KD was guarding me and I was making certain reads, right, making reads from the weak side to the corner, and he was looking at me like, how are you supposed to do that? And I was looking at him like, I'm more than just a dude who gets a bucket. I'm more than just a dude who dunks. I can actually think the game. So I, I believe that he's going to use this as the way to open his, open those guys' eyes. Like, they know how good he is, but I think them being around him every day, I think it's going to be it's going to be an interesting dynamic by the end of it. Like, right now, they're still learning each other, Ice, but I think mm-hmm. by the end of this, gold medal or not, they're going to walk away saying, uh, we have a problem. Mm-hmm. Th- that's what it's going to be. Yeah, 100%. Uh, curious to know if there's anyone that you thought so far should be playing better. Uh, I know, you know, there have been talks about a certain guy in Philly that maybe didn't play up to his potential yet. Wanted to get your thoughts on that and and the solidified, you know, starting five of what you think it should be. It's weird, Ice, because Joel Embiid does not seem like the perfect quintessential international player. From a physicality standpoint, yes, right? But international ball is so much quicker. It's 40-minute games. It's not 48. And... I feel like Joel, when he's playing with the 76ers, he gets it, he probes, he holds, he holds, he holds. Like he just drains a lot of the shot clock and there's movement around him or there's not. And US and and this FIBA game, 
he doesn't have time to do all that. Right. So I feel like playing from a speed standpoint and the fact that he doesn't look conditioned, he just looks like he is struggling out there. A like little he is, bit. Like he was on vacation with me in Miami. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I thought the same thing. Maybe that was him on the beach. Hold on. Maybe that was him with you in, in <laughs> Miami chilling. I, he is in such a weird position, Ice, because he needs to play and then he doesn't need to play. Like he need when he plays too much, he gets hurt. When he doesn't play enough, he gets out of shape. There is no sweet spot for him, or if there is a sweet spot, nobody's found it yet. Yeah. What do you, how do you do you think that eventually that Steve Kerr is going to say, you know what? Anthony Davis is the best big man internationally that we have as far as defensively, his activity moving up and down the floor. This is the guy that we're gonna go with as he's going through this experimentation process for the starting lineup. You know, I, I think it could be a possibility. You know, one thing that we don't talk about enough is like how important lineups are. You know, like, yes, it may be uh, the best roster that we've seen in a very long time. Uh, 10 of the top, you know, 15 best players in the world, whatever. But I think lineups still make a difference. And so I could also see that if, you know, AD inserted to that lineup, uh, where we talked about, you know, Ant-Man and LeBron and Steph, right? And I feel like if it looks better, if it seems better, especially on the defensive side of the basketball, because we know that the USA will get lax on that side of the basketball, I could absolutely see it. Yeah, I feel like, you know, for Joel Embiid, it's like, it, it just it just was interesting to me because I think when the Olympics come around, the, the best of the best are always at the top of their game, right? Like, unless there's injuries, you're mm -hmm. seeing the best of the best play the top of their game because they're getting ready for this moment that only comes around every four years. That's only a lifetime kind of moment. Um, and so, you know, kind of would expect him to be in shape by now, kind of would expect him to figure it out and understand the necessity of it. Yeah, you have maybe, what, 10 days, couple of weeks to get it to get to get there. But, yeah, I can see Steve Kerr making a change if it was necessary. Absolutely. Yeah, they look, they've got a game against Serbia tomorrow. They got a couple of games out there in Abu Dhabi. Then they go to London like it's a sprint. And I yeah. think that's one of those reasons why Kawhi Leonard is not there because I don't think the I don't think USA basketball could afford for him to get into deliberate Kawhi Leonard shape. Mm -hmm. Like maybe Kawhi was going to be in shape by the time like the Olympic Games started. But when you got Kevin Durant already hurt and he hasn't stepped back on the floor yet. That's one more wing that you know you have to account for. Right. And with Kawhi, the one thing I don't think people have also understood, USA basketball cannot afford for a Los Angeles Clippers newly minted contract star Kawhi Leonard to get hurt on their dime and for their real. time. For real. Like, <laughs> USA basketball ain't got the money. Like, it don't seem like they, get, they got the money. It, it seems like they would have it. But this is different than the NBA. They're in Abu Dhabi for a reason, y'all. And I'm sure y'all can figure it out, right? This ain't that hard. But, you know, that that sort of transitions me, Isis, into a question. I was, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday. And he says to me, I don't like the roster that USA Basketball has. And it was sort of started with, you know, Kawhi Leonard and not taking Jalen Brown. And his whole point was the U.S.'s strength as the world has caught up has been athleticism and quickness. And being able to pressure 94 feet. And he's looking at Steph being old, LeBron being old, KD being old. And he's saying, where's Aaron Gordon? Where's Jalen Brown? Where are your, you know, pressuring the ball 94 feet? You know, where's Draymond Green? And I'm like, uh, I don't know if we can have Draymond Green having an international incident out here, y'all. We can't, we, we cannot afford to have... Anybody getting whacked across the head or something like that. We can't afford that. We but don't I, need to start an Olympic Games brawl because of Draymond Green. He no, can just stay at home. I'm sure no, he'll be don't. broadcasting or talking about it somewhere. Yeah, because they he, can't but find But he was disappointed. He was disappointed, Isis. So was Kyrie Irving. Yeah. He was disappointed that there wasn't like the, the tryout process that had been instituted since Jerry Colangelo took over. Now it's Grant Hill as the managing director. It's a little bit different there. But just from the general premise... Do you buy into USA basketball not being athletic enough, even though it seems like they are athletic enough and quick enough to maybe compete with some of these teams and leaving all the bar pressure stuff to Derek White and Drew Holiday? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, we're still talking about the best players in the world. You know, yes, they might be older, but it's not like a, 
LeBron or a Steph or an AD can't compete, right? It's not like right. they just watch them go through a season where they didn't compete, you know? And so I kind of feel like athletic enough, maybe do you take a lesser athletic team, but you take a more mature, higher IQ basketball team? Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That's what I see. Yeah, I, I tend to, it's one of those things that you stick in your back pocket because in the conversation yesterday, I'm saying, yeah, I agree with you in theory, but I don't think that this will be a problem. I right. think with Derek White and Drew Holiday and even Anthony Edwards on the ball, they can get up the floor 94 feet. They can pressure 94 feet. You don't necessarily have to worry about that as much, but also the margin for error is a little different than it's been over the past you know, 20 years, like even in 2008. That gold medal game against Spain was not a cakewalk. Right, right, right. <laughs> that was right. that was prime Kobe Bryant, prime Dwayne Wade, prime LeBron James, and they were still battling <laughs> until the last minute with the Spaniards. You know what I mean? Like that was nothing to mess around with. Absolutely. Now Jalen Brown yesterday was at the uh, at Thomas and Mack for the Lakers and Celtics summer league game, and he brought his he brought his lady friend, and he brought their their lady friend Angel Reese, okay. and. I wonder with all of the hurt feelings that Jalen Brown has had, maybe it's rightful hurt feelings that Jalen Brown has had over not being selected for the Olympic team, him basically calling out Nike and saying Nike's had something to do with it, you know, because Jalen Brown, you know, used to put, you know, paper over the Nike checks back in the day when he was, you know, playing and stuff like that. So there's clearly a fractured relationship between he and Nike and insinuating that Nike, who's a USAB sponsor, you know, made a decision. Part of me felt like that was really bad form considering your teammate, Derek White, your teammate you just won a championship with, was the guy who was picked over you. Now, he he cleaned it up a little bit yesterday, said that he talked with Derek White and everything else and congratulated him, you know, privately. But did it feel a little weird to you that because it's your teammate that you can't be out here, you know, crying over spilled milk? Uh, I agree. I agree. I, I was trying to think of back to a situation where, cause this sounds so familiar before, right? Where someone gets picked and it's your teammate and you just have to show love first and be, you know, encouraging first. Um, but at the same time though, uh, I understand the frustration from him and I understand feeling the need to voice that in some way, shape or form. You know, I think when you take that type of disrespect, right? Because if, if you're really a competitor, if you really are as good as you say you are finals MVP, it would feel disrespected. And so I feel like it's hard to be able to take that disrespect and just be quiet and just say like, hey, my teammate who, yes, played an important role, but my teammate is going, you know, instead of me. But I think at the same time, um, like, again, this is why like rosters are made. You know, this is why it's a roster and it's not just the best people. Who do things like people see things differently. Yes, the tryout process is tough. And could we argue that, yeah, if there was a tryout process, we wouldn't be talking about this? Like, absolutely. But we also could still be talking about this. Right. So I don't know. I, but I, I agree with you that um, it was a little bit weird. But I also understood it being a competitor, like how, why why he wanted to say something. It just wasn't necessarily the, the greatest thing to say or smoothest thing to say. I don't know. He should talk to over his PR person. He asked me. I don't know. It, it was it was a bit weird. And, yeah. and you know, Ice asked me before we started, like, where are you right now? I said, I am in Detroit, Michigan, which will lead me to my next point. When I think of Olymp Olympic snubs, I think of one basketball Olympic snub. And this ain't that, y'all. OK, <laughs> this ain't Zeke getting snubbed in 1991-92 for the Barcelona games because Michael Jordan's feelings was hurt. I don't care about like like this ain't when I think of Olympic snubs, that's what I think of. Jalen Brown, I get it. You can have some hurt feelings, but Jalen Brown is young enough that he can still get back to it in four years. And also from the standpoint of team building. And I was talking to people, you know, with, you know, USA basketball, with the staff and everything else. And the one point that they made to me, Ice, was Derek White can come into a game and play the role of ball hawk for five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it is. And he won't need the ball on the other end of the floor. Mm. Inherently in that, which is not what they necessarily said, but I'm taking liberties here, taking practical liberties here. Inherently what they're saying in that is Jalen Brown, Eastern Conference Finals MVP, NBA Finals MVP. Yes, he can pressure you up the floor because we saw him do it with Luka Doncic. 
but also he was a hub on offense during the finals right. and he was getting the ball. You ain't getting the ball with Steph Curry, with LeBron, with KD, with Ant-Man, with, you know, Joel Embiid, assuming he's on the floor as much. Like, you wind up being just a guy. And I don't know if rightfully Jalen Brown would say, hey, I'm the last man standing in June. Those dudes were sitting at home, and I was the best player in the last two rounds of the most important series of the NBA season. I should get the ball. So I, I, I do think there's a balance there, but I wonder if there was a USAB sort of way that they could have called Jalen and said, hey, Jalen, we know you want to play. We don't know if this is a role that you would embrace or whatever. Like, I wonder if there's a way to kind of split the baby. Mm. Or maybe that information was maybe that was done. Who knows? Maybe the decision was made well enough in advance that it did not matter. Right. 100 percent. That's too. You are smart when ice. That's why we got you here. <laughs> that decision seemed to be made weeks in it. That decision was made during the NBA finals, if not before that. If mm. Kawhi Leonard was going to be gone, then we don't need another big wing. That we mm. need like a smaller guard who can play up as opposed to a wing who can play down. All right, cool. Let's get to what we really want to talk about here, ice. Summer League. <laughs> right? We have Summer League ball. N- how do I put this delicately? I can't put it delicately. <laughs> it looks very painful for Bronny James right now. Yeah. It does. He and and LeBron, I felt like tried to couch it as best he could before Summer League. I think when he was talking to, you know, us at USA basketball when I was in Vegas and we had asked him, uh, it was like a small session, maybe like nine or ten reporters. And I think we asked him about oh no, I think it was a bigger session. And we asked him about Bronny playing in summer league. And he says, you know, the numbers and all those other things won't matter. What he, whether he struggles won't you know, matter because it doesn't mean anything. The problem is, Ice, it really does look like a huge struggle from the California Classic, California Classic, excuse me, to how he played yesterday against the Celtics. I mean, yeah, the one shot he made, the crowd went wild. But, man, it was a lot of air balls. It was a lot of you know, man, does he look like he belongs out there? And I wonder, is this a matter of does he need development or is he just not ready for this? Can it be both? Can it be a little of both? You know, I think one, you know, practically looking at it, um, came from high school, played at USC, obviously after cardiac arrest and getting his body back, Right. Average two, four, four points at yep. USC, like did yep. not, you know, play a ton of time. So in me just watching him, to be honest, it just looked like he needs to hoop more. Like if I feel like if I was, you know, his trainer in his ear, like you just need to hoop more at any chance that you could be playing pickup with these guys on the court, doing whatever. You just need to hoop more. And every second you take, take it serious and get better in multiple ways. I think. Him looking uncomfortable is, yeah, he hasn't played at this level a ton, right? Like some of these guys he's playing against in summer league, a Reed Shepard, played every single minute at Kentucky, had plenty of time, looks amazing. Because, yeah, you in stride. You like you picking up where you left off. Unfortunately, like Bronny is picking up where he left off against a little bit better competition. And that's exactly what it looks like, like quite honestly to me. I think, um, you know, in doing some research, we've seen, you know, J.J. Reddick talk about, he was on a podcast the other day and talked about, you know, Bronny's play and kind of what he thought could be positive takeaways from it in terms of the defensive side of the basketball. He was like, we absolutely need to develop his shot. We need to develop his skills. He's got a great feel. But instinctively, he's a natural on the defensive side of the basketball. Cool. That doesn't surprise me. Like, knowing who his father is, the athletic ability that he grew up seeing firsthand, that doesn't surprise me. But I don't know if he can be a player that stays in the league because of his defensive side of the basketball. Like, that I don't see either. And so I feel like he needs time for development. I feel like he knows he needs time to develop and just to play more. And it, I think we all knew in him getting drafted, like, there were other second rounders, right, that had done more, experienced more, better stats, et cetera, right? Like, we knew what it was going to be. So I'm also not surprised by it. Like, I didn't think he was going to get in there and just be dropping 20 and like it was going to be easy. It, I felt like he was going to need time to hoop at this level and get adjusted. And that's what we're seeing. And like, if, as long as Lakers are committed to developing him, which duh, they will be, 
it'd be fine. I will say, I will tell you this. There is no way people are going to be ration, rational about this at all. No. Because they are seeing so much of themselves in this as opposed to seeing Bronny James. Like, Bronny is a symbol of something <laughs> and, or, and more directly lebron is a symbol of something here mm. so i've gotten the i've gotten the mentions in my tweets you don't have no kids i have i have friends of mine like getting into full-blown instagram arguments you ever got to an instagram argument you know how hard that is to get into an ig direct message argument with a friend of yours who is telling you, you don't know what it means to be a father and i'm like that's the point chief <laughs> This ain't about fatherhood. This ain't about about black symbolism. You know what I mean? Like, this ain't about that. The problem for Brownie and the Lakers is twofold. A, these dudes going to see themselves as getting getting their name off on mm. Brownie, right? Secondarily, there's going to be a player. Who knows? There's going to be some player who emerges from not being drafted to being a contributor to some NBA team this season. And if the Lakers are struggling, then Bronny will be looked at as, man, y'all didn't, why didn't y'all get him as opposed to giving Bronny a four year, 7.9 guaranteed million dollar deal? That's, um, that's unfair to him in this way. Like, you know, maybe he wanted this, but it feels like it's going to be an unfair amount of heat coming this way because so many other people were involved in making this decision. And ISIS, you make the biggest, most critical part of this when you said a year ago, this kid, suffered a cardiac arrest just because we didn't see it like we saw with uh demar hamlin in cincinnati the football player don't mean it didn't happen don't mean it wasn't just as scary so the fact that he's actually on a floor playing basketball is an accomplishment in itself it just doesn't mean it has to be there like uh, part of me wonders Man, would this 19-year-old be happier in college getting NIL money playing Call of Duty like mm. he did when he won the Call of Duty, you know, tournament <laughs> yeah. in Vegas or whatever? I guess it's, it's I, it just feels so weird to me. Even the discussion just feels a little swarmy to me, I suppose. And you can't really you can't really have these conversations out loud. You gotta have these conversations in quiet rooms. So I'll just end it with this. LeBron being out in Abu Dhabi, I'm sure you've seen coming to America. Right. When he finds out that Prince Akeem was working in McDowell's, my son works. Get him off the floor. Get him off the floor. Get him off the floor. That's what it, that's what it looks like. Get him off. He don't need to play no more. He only he he's seen enough. So maybe Bronny winds up spending some time with the South Bay Lakers or whatever they're called in the G League. And maybe they figure some stuff out. But let's get to let's get to Reed Shepard because mm. uh Ice, La put it like this. This is an affectionate term. I forgot who told me this. But whenever he likes a player, he says, oh, buddy got some shit to him. <laughs> Reed Shepard got some <laughs> to him, Ice. He got some wiggle. He got some athleticism. He can pass. He's got a pretty form looking jump shot. I mean, uh. I knew with the lineage that he was going to look good. And you could expect that he would look good in summer league. But he's even looking a lot more NBA ready than I thought, taking summer league as what it is. You know what right, I mean? Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, like completely agree with you. Thoroughly have enjoyed watching him play basketball. Um, you know, I worked with Yahoo and we did our NBA draft and our pre-show um, and, you know, Tom Haberstroh. Uh, was on that show with us. So he, you know, writes for Yahoo, also is big into stats and analytics. And Tom took every opportunity to bring up Reed Shepard, any chance he could. But yesterday he threw in our group chat, the screenshot of Trey Young saying, Reed Shepard, nice y'all. And like that immediately when I saw this as a topic, I was like, that's all I want to talk about is like, he's nice in every sense of the word. Like I like the pace that he plays with. Um, I like that he sets himself open um, off of screens, like to get open, to count action. It seems like he understands how to create or maintain an advantage. See, a lot of like young players when they get into the league, they forget that. Like they catch the ball and it's like, okay, if you don't immediately create an advantage or maintain the advantage once the ball was given to you, you've now ruined everything unless you can score one-on-one, -on -one, which normally and you get into the league is not is not your forte and so i feel like he does a beautiful job at that i um, really like seeing him operate off of pick and roll action um and scoring in the mid-range like i i love 
a, you know, a high efficient guard that can score in the mid range, like Chris Paul, that can just get to your spots. And mm-hmm. he seems like he has that type of ability off ball screens and operating to be able to get that. Um, I've really enjoyed like watching him play a hundred percent, like feel a hundred percent agree with what you said. It, it's funny for him because I look at, and you, and you just said it ice. When you get to the league, everybody tells you the, the lanes close quickly. You can't, if you're going to go, you got to go. So it's stuck in these guys' heads that they have to go as soon as possible. Yeah. With Reed Shepard, you're not speeding them up. You're not slowing them down. And it doesn't look like you're making him panic into making premature decisions. Like the passes are going to be on time, on target, and he's going to go where he needs to go with the ball. Like, like he and Rob Dillingham were the two prospects going into the draft that I was most intrigued by just because – like they can do some things with the ball, even though they came off the bench for Kentucky and everything else. And Kentucky was an NCAA disappointment, you know, as far as not getting to the final four. Thanks bracket. Um, I felt like these two dudes can come into the league with a more spread out floor and a more NBA like game. And they're going to figure some stuff out. Reed Shepard looks like, like you said, he, he plays with his body. He knows the angles. I, I can't say enough about him so far. Like, I'm not going to go and say, man, he should have been number one pick over those two Frenchmen. I'm not saying that. I'm just merely saying he looks NBA ready for a Houston team that looks ready to take off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, too, like, um, exactly exactly what you said. Just And and what Houston is trying to do and what they're building, he just seems like a very good piece to insert into that, to be able to grow and to be able to help right away. Um, I think especially, too, with just – I feel like when Reed Shepard's on the floor, like, the offense flows. You know, Mm -hmm. even when he's on the ball or off the ball, the offense flows. And that is one of the most dangerous things that you can have happen for an offense that is constantly flowing, is constantly moving. The defense has to guard five people. I feel like you put him on the floor, he forces them to guard five people because also the way he passes. I don't think we talked – enough you know a a lot about that but I also saw some really good passes in summer Mm -hmm. league some really good seeing the next play three steps ahead and like playing chess versus checkers kind of thing yeah you always wonder with the way college basketball is with the way AAU basketball is the gap it Mm. seems like it's widening whereas the international gap seems to be narrowing as far as the adjustment period for when guys come into the NBA how prepared they are Maybe Reed Shepard is a guy that's that's going to narrow the gap in a way because he's more quick twitched, even though he doesn't necessarily have to be sped up. Just an interesting, interesting thing. Last thing, because apparently Jalen Brunson likes taking discounts or at least the appearance of taking discounts. Signs signs a year earlier compared to if he would have signed next summer, he could have signed for one hundred million dollars more and gotten an extra year, which is on its face looks like in an amazing sacrifice, but also you remember the New York Knicks are run by Leon Rose and his agent is a guy named Sam Rose and Leon Rose and his dad, Rick Brunson have been close for decades, right? I guess the value of relationships, right? Signs for four years, 156 million ice. You know, I, I tend to look at things on its face and being like, man, there's something more to this. Not anything nefarious. I ain't talking about like a Joe Smith back in the day. Yeah. You take one year deal, one year deal, one year deal on a promise that you're going to get someone to back in. Like, I don't think it's anything nefarious here. But he can opt out after year three and get a 10 year max, where with this new TV money coming in, that number is going to be exponentially wider. So it's almost making more financial sense where he might not lose as much and he's helping the Knicks with more cap space. In the meantime, but on his face, how do you look at this and say, hey, man, I ain't passing up no extra hundred million dollars, one hundred thirteen million dollars. You you are your damn mind. Yeah, that that I, I don't know. I'm selfish. I'm selfish. <laughs> you know, like I like to win, but like also like the hundred extra mil might make me feel better at night. You know what I'm saying? Like if we don't, um, I, I think that nah, I think in all seriousness, like. I I'm start calling you Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, <laughs> out of here. Just know Ice is taking the money. Um, Vinny but, is too. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like I, I kind of felt like, you know, how all Knicks fans felt, right? In their reaction, like, oh my gosh, like this is a, again, you know, franchise player that you can build around, that a city can latch to, that you could tell is trying to build roots here uh, and get a championship here. And so I think that was my first thought was just like how selfless, you know, because there's tons of 
of men um, and women that wouldn't have done it. Um, one, though, two, my, my thought on the other end was like, it better pay off. Like, it better pay off. Like, uh, whoever they bring in, they're, it better pay off. It better be exactly what you want. And I, I also wonder, too, you know, um, the conversations that Jalen is having, right, with the, with the team, the organization about what needs to exist, you know, who should be there, what is the next piece that we need in order to get this next jump. So hopefully with him giving that up came with a lot of, uh, say, influence, you know, over, you know, what they're going to do next. Um, but that that was kind of my only thought to it, to be quite honest, was just like how selfless and like I would have taken the money and like let my teammates know about it. I'm sorry. You, you know how serious I know you are about this? Because your Philly accent just came out of you. I don't know if y'all heard it, but y'all gonna go back and be like, did she just say John? Oh my gosh. It did. It did. It did. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> she had been trying to tame that Philly. She's like, I'm gonna come in here and be polished. <laughs> I'm gonna come in here and, and not let the Philly out. And the Philly came out. You talk about sacrificing 100 million damn dollars. You are absolutely right. I'm glad the John came out of you. Because that... Please. And let's be perfectly honest here. Jalen Brunson just turned 27 years old and he is six feet tall. Durability. Now, granted, he is, you know, shouldery and, you know, stocky Stop. and everything else. But he plays for Tom Thibodeau. Right. We know what Tom Thibodeau does to bodies. OK. That's like high. That's like city miles and highway miles. That dude got a lot of potholes coming in the next three years which means he's going to be 30, 31 when he's going to be asking for maybe $80 million a year, which on its face sounds really incredible. And of course it is, but I think that's going to be more of the norm with all this new money coming in. But still at 31 years old, is your body going to be in tip top condition where it's going to be worth it for you and worth it for the New York Knicks franchise who plans on actually winning more than one playoff series? You know, because in case y'all didn't know, ICE, they won a grand total of one playoff series. And we treating them like they just played in June. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. This is true. Why are we doing this, though? Why Why do we do Is this like, do we just have love for them right now? Are we just so happy they're decent? And since they haven't been, that everyone's just like, yes? Like, why? Because like, you're absolutely right. Like, all that much didn't happen. Look, I'm not a New York Knicks trooper. I'm merely saying the last time the New York Knicks were in the conference finals, I was in high school. Mm. And although black don't crack, <laughs> I'm not as young as I look. Okay. I have no bullet holes, no stab wounds, you know, <laughs> no dog bites on my face. But I was in high school the last time the Knicks were actually a real contender. They are putting a lot into this Villanova thing. They're mm. putting a lot into this. Leon Rose thing, which is actually paid off. They're putting a lot into this Tom Thibodeau thing. And like you said, this sh better work. <laughs> <laughs> for real. That's it for the outlet. We're going to pay some bills and we're going to come right back with more of the good word. We're going to talk some W with Ice. Welcome back to the good word. We are here with Ice Young. Of course, the WNBA is on a break for the Summer Olympics and also the W All-Star Game. Me and Monica last week talked about the Caitlin Clark, Andrew Reese discussion. And of course, Twitter decided to have a field day for whatever reason, because we can't not be civil about anything <laughs> with these two people. We'll get to them a little bit later. But ISIS has got a number of things that I want to touch on as far as like fill in the blanks here. I have a thought, but I'm just curious where you sit with this. Okay. So I'm going to go down the list and see where you go. Best team is... Uh, it's still the aces, uh, technically right now they're third in the league. They're 16 and seven. Um, they have the best win streak in the league, four games in a row. Uh, the New York Liberty are at the top Liberty right now are at the top. Um, but I just don't believe they're the best team. I still think that the aces in the beginning of the season, they were without Chelsea gray, which is their point guard. Um, so the team looked a little bit differently. Their defense wasn't as intact. And so they dropped a couple of games, went through some adversity, which honestly is good for a team that's trying to three peat. Lose your games now versus later at the end of the season. Uh, but I still feel like the Aces are the best team with the best player in the world. We're going we gonna to get to that part a little bit later. Most <laughs> fun team to watch. Ice. Uh, okay. Um, Chicago, hands down. This was easy for me to say. Like, there are so many 
dogs in Chicago. I like to watch dogs hoop. We talked about Ant-Man earlier. I feel like on the women's basketball side, the Ant-Man is like Kennedy Carter. Um, if you haven't seen Kennedy Carter play for Chicago, she is just electric. Like five nine guard, has the quickest first step in the league. Beautiful pull up jump shot, can knock it down from three. Like also a hound on defense. But I feel like that with Angel Reese, who's a hound inside, Camilo Cardoso, Marina Mabry, like it's just a bunch of pit bull personalities along with like dog game. And it's just very fun to watch when they're playing and competing at a high level and winning. Um, And then I think their coach, Therese Weatherspoon, like is in herself, she is an antic to watch. Like if you are watching her on the sideline, you will be just as entertained by the game. Um, I, they do like these in-game interviews sometimes, you know, with these games, which I can't stand, by the way, I cannot stand putting the headset on like mid game, but she'll be mid game guys. And Camilla Cardoso get an M1 and she will yell, let's go. And like going off, maybe a, maybe a curse word in there too, but like just fantastic energy. Um, Chicago are some hoopers. I, 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 I'm happy with how they're playing right now this season. They're top eight in the league, which right now if the season were to end, they'd be in the playoffs. Um, but just like really good personalities, like fun to watch, good basketball too. It, it's funny. I think of Dawn Staley speaking mm. of, you know, you being from Philly and, and that video of her posting saying, you don't do that to Camilla. <laughs> you don't do that to Camilla. John, make sure you, John find out and put that in there. Like that, that is just hilarious. Oh, Camilla. Oh no, don't do that to Camilla. Do not do that to Camilla. Now you just brought up Spoon. As you know, as your favorite coach, is she your coach of the year? Uh, Cheryl Reeve is my coach of the year uh, for the Minnesota Lynx. Um, you know, Cheryl Reeve has won the most championships in the W. She's won four. Uh, she knows how to win in this league, done it for a very long time. Coaching USA at the Olympics on the women's side. Um, but really, like, you know, the Minnesota Lynx, they won the Commissioner's Cup this year for the first time in franchise history, which was huge. So that's the in-season tournament and the W make a lot of money. Um, and so they beat the New York Liberty. They're fourth in the league right now. But why why she's my coach of the year is because their defense is the best defense in the W right now in terms of defensive rating and getting stops. But it is not the best athletic girls in the league. It's It's actually a bunch of shooters and athletic four and five players who just all play on a string, play together. And I think that's because Cheryl Reeve really has them doing that. And so it's surprising to me that they have the best defense in the league. I think it's just a credit to her. Now, <clears throat> this is where the conversation, of course, is going to get tricky slash ugly. <laughs> Rookie of the year. You got it, it's it's a two person, it's a two person race. You got the league's best rebounder versus the league's probably the league's best passer. And Caitlin Clark, where do you sit on this? This is not legally binding, people. <laughs> this is just as of July 16th. Where do you sit with Rookie of the Year right now? Okay. So if you would have asked me a week ago, I would have told you Angel Reese. Because I would have said that we have to respect the fact that this streak exists. Uh, and that she holds a streak as a rookie, 15 double straight double doubles. We did only play 22 games. Like how quickly she was able to adjust. Amazing. But in this day today, I have to say Caitlin Clark. Why? Because of the success of the Indiana Fever. The Fever are a team that couldn't win 10 games two, three years in a row. And back to back number one draft picks. Yes, Aaliyah Boston is playing fantastic. But I'm really impressed with Caitlin Clark's growth over this last span, maybe the last 10 games or so. I, I thought the first 10 games of the season, it was jam-packed. They had the toughest schedule. They were playing a lot of games. Her body, she looked like she was physically getting mm -hmm. beat up. Yep, yep. She looked exhausted. Um, I felt like she started to become a pro in the last 10 games. She had five games in a row with double-digit assists. That should be her thing. She should be the Sue Bird of the league. Plus, a better, deeper shooter is what Caitlin should become in this league. So I feel like right now I have to give it to her. She had the first triple-double, um, which we expected. If you knew, you expected that to happen eventually. And I expect more to come this year, honestly. But right now, at this point, it would be of Caitlin Clark. Okay, so this, that's as of right now. So you, you, <laughs> you, are, you have the right to change your mind. Now, from a grander scale, Ice... Is this the best rookie class in W history? Oh, I feel like it has uh, the potential to be. I feel like it has the potential to be, right? With Caitlin, with Angel Reese, with Camilla Cardoso, 
with Rakia Jackson. See, we talk about these same rookies all day. We talk about Kaylin and Angel, but <clears throat> Rakia Jackson just finished a 22-point performance for the LA Sparks. Like, she has having a great rookie season. Um, as well as Aaliyah Edwards that plays for the Washington Mystics. Yeah, they're just yeah. having they're just having a tough year. You know, they've had injuries, they haven't won as much, and it's normally not not of that of a DC team. They're without Elena Deladon this year, that which really hurt. But I feel like Aaliyah Edwards has also um had some really good basketball and she's grown. So I feel like it has the potential to be. But in doing my research, I had to go back and like look at okay, let's see some of these draft classes and like what which ones were good ones. 2013 was the 2024 draft class. Like, I, I don't know if you remember, 2013 is when, like, women's basketball had gotten another surge of media. A ton of things were happening. But in that class was uh, Brittany Griner, Elena Deladon, and Skylar Diggins-Smith. Those three right there is really tough to beat. Those three right Hall there. Hall of Famers. That's th- yeah. that's, those are three supernovas. Hall of Famers. Hall of Famers. Two of them are Olympians. Hall of Famers. Another class that was very good, and this will challenge those who are listening who have been following the w-, w for a couple of years, but 2001, Lauren Jackson, Tamika mm. Ketchings, Katie Douglas, and Penny Taylor. So this is like back when the Phoenix Mercury won championships with Diana yep. Taurasi and Dewana Bonner was on the team. Lauren Jackson, one of the best post players that we have seen in the world ever. Um, the, the Aussie, I believe she's actually still competing for Team Australia at some crazy age of like 42, 43. Um, But that class was also good. And so I feel like what it's going to take is uh, besides Caitlin and maybe Angel or Cameron Brink, right? It's going to take about four of them to become Hall of Famers for them to be, for them to beat these two classes is what I'm seeing. Yeah. Don't forget Cameron Brink out with the ACL, but Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. still it's part of very much a part of this conversation. Now, MVP, I feel like it's a very easy pick for MVP. And I think it's, is it time to have to start having a wider discussion about Asia Wilson? That's your MVP? I thought you was gonna say Caitlin. No, no, I'm not gonna say that. Don't do that. Kidding. Don't do me like that. Sorry, do me like kidding. That. that was a pump fake joke. That was. <laughs> that was. That was a come on now. That was a bad pump fake. I ain't I ain't that much in the tank. <laughs> Are you kidding? Um, Not no, been you two, and, two Americas. Two Americas yeah. says that Caitlin Clark is the MVP. Yeah, Not this yeah. America. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, as soon as I said that, fist pumped, and now they're upset with me, and they probably clicked off. Sorry. But your question was? My question was, is it time to have start to start having a greater discussion mm. about Asia Wilson? Because I feel like she's clearly the best player in the game, the most impactful player in the game, and just putting her in a historical context is probably what's next. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, um, when you have the most points in a franchise, which she does at the Aces, um, when you uh, have already won two championships, have the chance to three-peat, which has not been done, um, I think there are a lot of these conversations that Asia is now in to become the GOAT. You know, is she the greatest of all time, blah, 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 et cetera. We're also reaching a point in the W2 where people don't always know the history. You know, so they don't know, like, the Cynthia Cooper dice that came before, mm-hmm, right? Or the Cheryl mm-hmm. Swoops that came mm-hmm. before and, like, could actually see them. And so I say to say it's almost – it's definitely working in Asia's favor because if you don't know the history, you only know what you know right now, and that's the best, you know? And so I think for a huge generation of girls and women's basketball, Asia will be the GOAT. Like, Asia will be Kobe, and it will last a very long time. I think just her dominance and how she plays the game, different sides of the basketball – both on both sides of the basketball at a high level. Um, but I feel like with the accolades she's already gotten, I mean, it seems like every other night she's breaking a record. And like I'm, like records, people, like she mm-hmm. has the most 25-plus point games, 10-plus rebounds games in a season at 11. We are not at the second half of the season. Like she could get 11 more uh, and like squish the record. Um, it's also a year in which the W is playing the most games he's ever played, right? So it's playing 40 games this year. Last year, it had played 36. So some of these records she'll start to break just because they have more games. It's just right. a bigger sample size. But at the same time, I don't think it takes anything away from her. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I start thinking about Asia Wilson and what she could be in this league. I start thinking about, like, a Maya Moore, you know, where it's just mm-hmm. like it didn't matter how long Maya played, when her career was cut short, she will always go down as one of the best. And I don't care who you put her up against. It's just going to be that. I feel like Asia is getting to that point where it's like, yeah, how can we not call her one of the best ever? That's a great point. Look, I, I came up in the era where 
hey, I heard about Cheryl Miller and I heard about the respect that people have for Cheryl Miller. It's almost Cheryl Miller is almost like Babe Ruth in for a real? way that you just, you know, like like Wilt, like, yeah, the, the record book is owned by Cheryl Miller. And then you see Cheryl swag and you're like, yeah. I can see Cheryl being the best because Cheryl's out there talking and kicking it and destroying Reggie, which I found <laughs> could be completely hilarious. And then I got to see Cheryl Swoops and Cynthia Cooper on the same team. Like Cheryl Swoops was coming off having a baby. You know what I mean? Like, and then the next year she was out here like, oh yeah, I'm like the dog on this team. And then <laughs> Cynthia Cooper was like, no, I'm the dog. And then Tina Thompson was like, hey y'all, <laughs> throw this rock down here. <laughs> number, number one pick right here. Ever. Yeah. yeah th- th- to th- me. Th- th- Throw this rock down here so I can give Lisa Leslie some work. (laughs) Give Rebecca Lobo some work. Like, that's that's just, I think it's just in a great place. And I think Asia Wilson, like you said, with the numbers she's putting up with, and I think America is starting to catch hold of her a little bit more. I think this is one of those things where, you know, the Caitlin Clark effect, theoretically, where people are starting to see, like, oh, there are great players in this league. And once you get past the venom and you're actually watching the games, you're like, oh, she's a beast. Okay, cool. Asia yeah. Wilson is there. That sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah. I'm looking I'm looking forward to how this all plays out, especially after the Olympic team. Cause in case y'all didn't know, the most dominant Olympic team in terms of the United States doing anything is the US women's Olympic basketball team. Ain't nobody coming close. Mm-mm. They had a couple close games, I think, in 21. But for the most part, they have been dominant. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to more of Ice Young here talking at John. Like, I'm just <laughs> glad you brought the John. I'm, I'm glad you were so hyped that John came out of you. I appreciate you coming on today again. Uh, thanks so much for having me, fam. Always good to be here. Always good to have you. Thanks again to producer John and the entire team who works hard from behind the scenes on this podcast. Jake and Dan, they'll be back for another episode of No Cap Room on Thursday. And I'll be back next week, maybe Monday, maybe Tuesday. Who knows? Until then, everybody be safe.